They say to not look a gift horse in the mouth. Well, a few days ago, I shot the gift horse. Hello, ladies and gents. I'm the Spiffing Brit, and I break video games for a living. Today's video is very special, as the developers and Paradox Interactive personally reached out and paid me to play the game, with, of course, a very generous gift to my giant pile of tea money. And with that, the proverbial gift horse has arrived. The one rule they gave me was have fun. And on the 4th of April, I had a lot of fun. Now today, ladies and gentlemen, normally when we break a video game, we focus on just one big exploit. But today, as it's special and the developers have sponsored today's video, we're going to be covering four lovely broken gameplay features. So make sure you have yourself a proper brewed cup of Yorkshire tea gold, because this is going to be brutiful. God, that's a terrible pun. Welcome to Age of Wonders 4, a grand strategy 4X game that I would describe as Civ 5 if instead of Gandhi having nukes, Gandhi instead had the ability to turn his population into the undead and turn your capital city into an active volcano. Remember kids, it's not a war crime if there's no survivors. The game has the wonderful empire building of a normal Civ game with the combat of XCOM, and the result is, well, magnificent. The developers intended me to play this game normally and have fun building up a wide empire of balanced forces. I will instead be showing you all today how to destroy this game. Sorry, developers. So Age of Wonders 4 is quite a special little game, whereby we actually have ourselves a pantheon, which is kind of like a meta progression system. Now, as I've been playing the game quite a lot, I've kind of finished the pantheon tree. Well, as in, I've finished it up to the most important thing in the pantheon tree, which is the Chosen Destroyer's Culture Trait, which we'll be getting to in a second. Now, what we're going to be doing is playing a brand new custom game in my wonderful custom created land called Spiff's Chaos Land. Now, I'm going to crank up the amount of AI players in this world up to 12, because trust me, the more punching bags we have, the better. Now, when it comes to actually playing the game, we need to pick ourselves a faction to play as. These factions are all led by one glorious hero, say like Alfred Elderstone here. He's your classic human dude. He believes in feudalism and building a mighty strong human empire. Good for him, it's pretty boring bog standard stuff. I've also got some fruity little weirdos on this list, like Cruel Brightlord. He's a rat. Effectively, rats, when they win fights, just eat the corpses, which, as you can imagine, creates more rats. These guys are brilliant to play as if you just want a gigantic horde. However, where this game truly, truly turns into an aptly glorious experience is when you just get to make your own faction. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing today. Unlike normal humans, we're going to make our particular humans keen-sighted with a focus on overwhelm tactics. This makes them more likely to hit, and guess what? When they do hit, they've got a higher chance of getting a critical attack provided they're standing next to another one of their dudes. Next up, we need to pick our society traits. Now, when it comes to actually picking these traits, some of them are very, very useful indeed. However, one of them is very broken. The Chosen Destroyers. This is how we're mostly going to be destroying the entire balance of the game today. The Chosen Destroyers is a lovely thing that I picked up, whereby basically we throw all of the normal gameplay completely out of the window. In a normal game of Age of Wonders 4, you want to settle a bunch of cities and produce a bunch of units. If you are a chosen destroyer, you can only settle one city. However, every time you raise to the ground someone else's city, your income of mana, knowledge, and gold is just permanently increased. If that city gets resettled and you raise it again, guess what? Your money, mana, and knowledge gets increased yet again. You can repeat this ad infinitum and completely destroy this game, which is exactly why we're going to be playing as them. And then our next perk that we're going to be picking up is mana channels. This is going to allow summoning units to be incredibly cheap because guess what? Sure, you could actually just build an army out of a city. Alternatively, you can just break the game, which is what we're going to do. Now, even though we are going to want to go down a route to your chaos once we get into the game, it is very important that the first and most broken thing you pick up, ladies and gentlemen, is this. The lovely Tome of Zeal, because it gives us the ability to summon zealots. Zealots are a terrible tier one unit. However, they're completely broken. Anyway, next up, we're going to want to pick up a wizard king. So, we're bam, wizard king we go. Next up, I need to actually uh, reveal myself, and that means creating a lovely boy, but also actually we need a good flag. Oh my god, the penguins. Oh gosh, okay right, look, there's a penguin flag. You have to go for the penguin flag, and I'm going to randomize the way my ruler looks, because you know, the more powerful and intimidating he looks the better. Right, fantastic, I've created our glorious overlord today. He looks brilliant and evil. So this is going to be our emperor. Now we need to give him some kind of like, evil name, something that really inspires fear into our enemies. So he is going to be 
Emperor Barry the Destroyer. There we go, Barry the Destroyer. Now that is a name for the ages. And of course, our race is going to be the lovely British. Now the British will make up the bulk of our fighting force and consequently they will embody all of the many, many important critical assets of Britishness, like, you know, just stealing stuff, raising stuff to the ground, and just destroying many ancient wonders of the world. So welcome, Barry the Destroyer. A new ruler emerges. Explore your surrounding and expand your domain. Prepare to face your rivals and become the master of this realm. Anyway, welcome to our capital city, Equilon. No, that's a terrible name. Say hello to our new capital city, Barry's Party Palace. Barry's Party Palace is going to be the home of our empire. Now, the game is very simple. Our city has one population, which means it can only take up this one tile. Every time we get a population, we can simply annex an additional region, turn it into, say, a farm or a forestry camp. We're, of course, going to go farms because farms equal food, food equals more population, and more population generally equals more good. The army of Barry is going to generally try and fight as many battles as possible in this nice early game because the more battles we fight generally speaking the more experience Barry will get and consequently the more powerful Barry will become. So we've just summoned our first zealot and it's time for us to do our first fight. Uh -huh. In this first fight we can of course do manual combat but instead we're just going to auto combat this first fight because you know I don't want to lose that would be embarrassing and we're bam we got a glorious victory Barry the destroyer wins and we get the 47 magic crystals those units were stood upon. Oh my goodness we've also found our our first ancient wonder on the map. Now the map is going to be filled with these ancient wonders. They're basically like giant dungeons that you have to go in and fight in, but if you manage to win and you get to control this terrain, you're going to get lots of lovely wonderful bonuses. Think of say the relics and slay the spire, that's generally what I'd equate them to. So our capital has finally grown to the point where it can expand, so immediately we're going to pick up these pastures because that will help grow our city faster. At the same time we'll spend some of our gained money to hurry the production of the storehouse up will also help us generate population faster, we'll grab a workshop, grab a vendor, and I'll even cheese the game a bit by spending some of our lovely Imperium currency here, which is definitely not meant for this, on just getting ourselves an additional population as soon as possible, which I'll spend on this quarry. Yes, lovely. Now, as I mentioned, we are technically chosen destroyers, and what that means is effectively our one purpose in the entire world is to raise everything to the ground and kill everyone. Now, that's of course very evil, and because it's a very evil thing indeed, generally speaking it means the entire world hates you. In fact you should actually start the game off at war with every faction in the game. Uh, one minor issue however you don't. For example we're going to meet a free city. They're effectively the city states of this game. Very very powerful. You turn them into vassals. Very useful indeed. We've met the free city of Avernos. Now Avernos us being the same race as us should immediately want to kill us. However they can't because even though it says we started war with all other rulers and free cities we actually don't baby. Perfect Balance. Now what I have decided to do is declare war on Avernos here before they can grow too large and in doing so I've must up a giant stack of zealots and summon them out of thin air. Now despite the fact that you know they're magic units that apparently cost 8 mana upkeep, uh, they don't so we're fine to just declare war here and use our giant summoned army. Now of course it is a low risk battle, many of these units will die, that's a sacrifice I'm willing to take because um, it's fine, others will live and all that matters is that we took control of Avernos. Now, normally this is where you'd be able to, say, control the city, annex it, blah 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 blah. Uh, we're going to raise it to the ground. They might be our peoples, but they aren't following me, so consequently burn them all. And luckily our ruler has leveled up as well, making him even more powerful. That's right, Barry the Destroyer is looking brilliant. So naturally we're going to grab him the Undying Loyalty Perk, which basically means he can turn his units into temporarily undead units that just can't quite die. Perfect stuff indeed. Indeed. And here we go ladies and gentlemen, on turn 16 the lovely city of Avernos is about to be raised into the ground and I think I'm heading my way over towards another AI civilization. There's probably another free city around here. I mean this map is gigantic if you can't see. It doesn't really matter how swiftly we get to all of these empires but we will be getting to all of these empires. Right and here we are ladies and gentlemen, we're about to do the ultimate race transformation. We're going to turn all British people into spawn kin, which does make them smaller, uh, which very funnily kind of shrinks them down. I, I kind of love it. Look, they're tiny now. It's brilliant. I mean, it does make their arms kind of a little bit too big and the weapons a bit silly, but it's fine. Look, we're, we're just all a bunch of little small little zealots now. So uh, everyone's happy.
And that means more units, more damage, more power. One eternity later. So far we have raised eight cities in total into the ground. So uh, yeah, we're getting quite a lot of magic crystals. Oh, and my goodness, the orange AI decided they wanted to settle a new city. So they settled on this city that I tried to raise. Oh, the absolute fools, ladies and gentlemen. Do they not know what they have done? <laughs> this city doesn't even have walls. It doesn't even have walls, you fools. Right, well, um, that's, uh, that's gonna become their problem very quickly. Oh, by the way, I can summon three units per turn now. That's how high our world casting map pool is because, um, because we've truly become an absolute sorcerer king. We just cannot be defeated. Right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We finally made our way over to the Celestial Heaven, aka the capital of the Orange Faction, uh, and we are about to knock them out of the game because, um, well, my army is very powerful now. We have our glorious Baylor here, which um, is slowly going to get more and more empowered and become just generally a bit of an overpowered god. Anyway, we'll just auto our way through this fight. Glorious total victory. Our Baylor, how many more kills did you get? You got two more kills. Very good. You're getting nice and strong. Anyway, we also managed to wipe out their entire army and we lost um, three zealots. That's it. Oh my god. <laughs> Imagine having two and a half stacks and only being able to kill three tier one units. Oh dear, oh dear. It's not even like they're fielding low quality units. They're fielding, you know, pretty meaty stuff. Uh, there's just one issue. Uh, I am a god, uh, an absolute god. And Akion the Endless here is about to die. There we go. That is their lord dead. And our Baylor gets two more slaughter empowerment buffs. Lovely stuff. Anyway, now that he has been defeated, I will raise his entire city into the ground. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I think now is probably the best time to show off our true power. Um, we have an army assembled here, which is, you know, a mix of chaff and actually okay units, but most importantly, uh, we are getting attacked by the full might of the strongest faction in the entire game, these green little toads. They are very powerful indeed. However, I can summon a whole bunch of gremlins for free, and all they can do is, well, uh, die. So I can automate this entire combat and uh, do basically nothing as I melt all of their cities. Meanwhile, I our resources are getting a little bit out of control. The issue is the game can't really scale to our size because I can just endlessly raise the same cities over and over again and I don't really have any consequences for losing any fights. This does create a little bit of a problem of course because it means the amount of damage I can do is effectively endless and losing battles is pretty much meaningless when I can get all of the resources to resummon an entire army each turn because well you know that's fair. Right well it's turn one for one and most of the AIs in the game are dead. There are only five AIs left in the game and I'm about to uh, execute what I like to call a pro gamer maneuver and um, commit a little bit of a war crime. Now here's the thing, late game uh, I can just target some of their units and uh, do damage to them with say my abyssal flames. This effectively sets fire to a province and deals 20 damage to all units in an enemy's army. The issue is I can't actually target their lands because they're protected by this very pesky little spell jammer here. Fortunately for me, however, the developers um, accidentally included a little bit of what I would like to call a workaround. You see, I cannot cast this in a province that is protected by a spell jammer, but the uncolonizable and uncontrollable mountain province next to them, oh yes, I can cast my fire spell there and do damage to the units in the city. The game just cannot stop me. So yes, I will cast this spell next to them, dealing damage to all of their units, making sure they get nice and low and very vulnerable to my attacks. Look at their poor little armies. Oh dear, oh dear. Meanwhile, my glorious battle armies will simply stand here, awaiting the attacks from our very devilish foes. A few moments later. And then if we attack this unit here, our 6,000 strength will attack 3,400. There we go. We can automate combat and watch as we uh, should hopefully win without taking too many casualties. I mean, the game has a fair bit to process here, so I imagine this is quite a complicated battle. There we go. It worked. No casualties. <laughs> oh my god. Oh dear. And then here we go, wabam, our final fight. We uh, should have now successfully destroyed pretty much the entirety of the enemy's armed forces with this fight. Um, dear lord, oh my god, this is such a mess. I shouldn't be able to do this. This is the most powerful faction in the game. They're the strongest military in the game and they just grouped it up into one giant blob and I've just systematically eliminated them one by one. And look at that, all of my heroes have leveled up. Right, well, the time has come. Uh, we are here to attack uh, the poor city of Seven 
ever fought. Um, now, normally the city would have defenses, however, for the temporary nature of this fight, I have effectively earthquaked all of them away. In fact, I've lowered the health of all of the defenders so much that they're just not going to be able to survive. So I'm just going to auto combat this one. It's over. I mean, this this guy is completely done for. He is still the, the strongest player in the game, apparently. Game, when will you learn? He is not the strongest player. I am the strongest player. I've always been the strongest player. I cannot be defeated. My goodness. Right, well, once again, glorious total victory. No damage taken at all. The city is now ours. la di da di da uh, We just walked into the center of the city. We can then attack this stack of troops. This is an instant murder. You can then also raise this city ground, love jubbly. Uh -huh. And oh my, oh my, you even built yourself a little teleporter here. But you thought that would make you safe. Well, alas, no, you're going to get auto-resolve oblivion. And um, just like that, I think their entire military has just accidentally been evaporated by a stack of units that just seemingly can't die. When they do die, I can just summon more. That seems completely fine to me. Right, well, welcome back. I have teared down the spell jammer of the final region and uh, whilst we were sieging it down we were attacked twice by um, some giant stacks. Of course uh, it didn't make a single difference because yes we murdered them and we lost no units. Anyway I'm going to cast this spell and turn this terrain into a desolate terrain. Yeah this will be fine but bam. What's the worst that could happen? Yes a uh, whole bunch of fire damage. Fire damage isn't that bad for us. We take hardly any. Uh, they however do take damage and look their poor king here is trying to defend this city. Bless him. He's trying okay. He's really trying Try. He doesn't quite know why everything's on fire all of the time. Anyway, I'm just going to cast uh, yet another cheeky bit of abyss flames. Just scorch up the land a little bit more. Lovely jubbly. And um, yes, I think next turn uh, we will attack you. And I think this is probably the end of the game for us because we have kind of defeated it just, just a little bit. Um, I mean, this is supposedly the strongest AI around. Still is, apparently. They haven't managed to kill basically a single unit of ours. I, I don't, I, I think the game's lying to me. Oh dear. Right, well, a single turn has passed, and in that turn he has managed to raise an entire army of peasants to defend this city. <laughs> oh, you fool. Right, well, what we're going to do is cast uh, Abyssal Flames twice in this province, because why not? I might as well. And uh, now we're going to fight this battle, uh, because I can. This battle I'm going to auto-resolve. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not going to be fair, and I think I can kind of predict the outcome. Oh, okay, yep, yeah, well, there's the outcome we knew was coming. A sweeping total victory where I lost no units and took basically no damage. And with that, the the uh, glorious frog empire is dead. Another AI has been eliminated from the game and we did it ladies and gentlemen. We absolutely smashed them. From this point on I just need to move my three stacks of troops anywhere around the map and just blow up whatever's there. The AI is never going to be able to retaliate because they can't even get into my own terrain and even if they did I only have one giant city that I can very easily defend. They however are perpetually ruined. So there you have it ladies and gentlemen. Gentlemen, it turns out Age of Wonders 4 is a perfectly balanced game with no exploits whatsoever. Ah, welcome back into the world of Age of Wonders 4, ladies and gentlemen, where today I'm going to show you how to, um, just print units out of thin air. Now, this exploit was brought to my attention by my lovely Irish friend Potato McWhiskey, and my goodness is it perfectly balanced. In order to pull this exploit off, you just need two cities that are relatively close to each other, and this lovely bonus here, the Wild Expansion. Basically, upon completing the annexation of a province, an animal unit will be spawned under your control. This is a brilliant way of just getting units for free, and allow me to demonstrate how. Now in order to do this you must wait until one of your cities has a large enough population. In our case we're going to use the right of expansive growth to instantly increase the population in all of our settlements by one. And then what we're going to do is trade a province back and forth. This lovely quarry province here I'm going to trade to Harperton. There we go. Well bam it is going to take one turn to trade. Meanwhile this farm province here I'm going to transfer to Twinmount. And this farm province here I can transfer to Harperton as well. Well bam lovely stuff. Now this is the kind of thing that happens when 
when you annex a province. Flowing fields annex this province over here, and we have received a unicorn. That's right, a unicorn is, of course, a tier-free celestial shock unit with fantastically low maintenance. That's wonderful. Now, that's what's meant to happen. When my city expands, I get a free animal unit. But the issue is the developers have it coded so that when a new province is added to a city's control, they get a free unit. That creates one minor issue when you are simply moving one province from one city's control to another, because all that happens when we end turn is free wonderful units are just going to be summoned straight out of bloody thin air. Oh, and would you look at that? We have ourselves a little piglet, we have ourselves a warg, and we have ourselves a spooky spider. We can simply merge all three of these together, lovely stuff, and we can use these guys to help add chaff into our various battles. See, look, this fight is nice and easy now. Glorious successful victory, and oh dear, a warg died. That could take people time to produce, but don't worry, we can just simply transfer these provinces around again. Once again, we're going to transfer this farm to Twin Mount, and then transfer this farm to Harperton, and if we repeat this process over and over again, we will just simply get free units every time. That's right, there's literally no point in paying for gold and making your own units when you can just spaff out a bunch of animals. Oh, and also because you have to go down the nature affinity tree in order to exploit out all of these free animals, guess what? Those animals get buffed to heck. Good luck trying to kill a stack of celestial unicorns, my friends. Those things are spiky. So thanks, developers. That's lovely and spicy. And best of all, ladies and gentlemen, you can achieve this incredibly early into the game. My goodness, it's only turn 20 and I can already spaff out a bajillion units for free. Cheers, devs. That's perfectly balanced. Now, one thing that I really like about Age of Wonders 4 is that this game has meta progression. That's right, not everything is immediately unlocked when you start out the game. You see, effectively, our heroes are working under a glorious pantheon, and my pantheon is that of the Yorkshire Tea Drinkers. The greater we do in games, the more experience we gain, and the more experience gives us pantheon points that we are then able to spend on glorious upgrades. Some of these upgrades are pretty basic, just like cosmetic items, and then some of them are horrifically overpowered, like the Chosen Destroyers, which limits you to one city but allows you to steamroll the entire game with endless amounts of gold, mana, and knowledge. It's horrifically broken. Or what about the silver-tongued trait, which allows all trade deals with free cities to cost you 100% less resources. This just basically means you can rob everyone and they love you for it. It's perfectly balanced. But how do we efficiently get these Pantheon points? Well, the developers would have you believe that this is something that should take time and it'll be very slow, but in actuality, it's incredibly easy to farm Pantheon points. Just simply create a custom realm, the land realm. What you're going to want to do is basically create a 1v1 world where there's only you and one additional AI. Make sure they start really close to you and just crank down the difficulty to nothing. Then you want to pick the most overpowered rush faction in the game, which um, if you couldn't guess, it's the rat boys. Yep, these rat boys are brilliant because their tier one units are extra powerful and also extra cheap. So they're fantastic at just spunking out more dudes. Okay, don't clip dude spunking. Anyway, welcome into the world, lovely stuff. Effectively, what we need to do right away is try and work out where the other AI is located. We also want to fight and kill as many of these random AIs as possible because in doing so, we're going to gain rewards and loot and also some gold, and said gold we can use to rush the production of this storehouse, which in turn will grow our town faster. Effectively, we're just playing a super turbo game. And fantastic, we found the AI. They are located just over here. Ah, yes, look at them. We've got Sinran to live here. This man is a great axe wielder, and he has a whole bunch of magic boys in his army. That's very good. Now, if we were to fight them at the moment, it is a risky battle, meaning we will probably lose. But luckily, we have a few advantages on our side. Number one, do not fight fair. Make sure to recruit and and hire more heroes than you actually should have access to as early as possible. This has given us a wonderful additional fighter in this upcoming battle. And just like that, with the addition of a hero, this fight, which was going to be basically impossible, is now very, very viable and is in fact a low-risk battle. So naturally, we're going to declare a war, which is completely unjust, but who cares, because it's going to kill their king. And in doing so, all of our dudes have leveled up, and we've got a whole bunch of food and magic. Now, this is very important. As our next actions, we must immediately be lined where they came from, which is down here somewhere. Effectively, we must now rush at them as fast as humanly possible. Uh, and I do believe I have found myself the enemy capital. Yep, there it is. And of course, they have summoned their lord back. That's very
very good. Uh, the issue is it's not going to be enough. He is going to die next turn. Now, here's the way the game works. Pantheon points are very important. If you achieve 500 experience in a session, which you can gain by, as you can see, improving your diplomacy rating, defeating enemy heroes, leveling up, you get experience points. But they're pretty terrible. Pretty much each time they're just giving me 10 experience each, which means I'm going to need to get 50 integers of my heroes leveling up before I even get one Pantheon point. Well, I know something that's a fair bit faster than all of that, and that's just quite simply winning the game, which is exactly what we're going to be doing. Effectively, all we're going to do is just quite simply sit back, relax, and wait for our lovely siege to be successful. And just like this, on turn 13, ladies and gentlemen, the game is over as we've just captured the enemy capital city. This does work on pretty much any difficulty. You don't need to play on the easiest. It just makes it faster by about two turns. But in doing so, we've killed the enemy AI. He's the only other person in the game, and that means we win. Now, winning the game, ladies and gentlemen, well, that gives you 500 experience, which, as you can imagine, is drastically more valuable than anything else. So, wabam, we've just won the game. It really is that easy. And would you look at that, ladies and gentlemen? That's an immediate level up. Oh my, two Pantheon points we gained. Two Pantheon points, wonderful. Oh, so many potential bonuses I can get. Ah, another glorious win for the perfectly balanced Yorkshire tea drinkers, ladies and gentlemen. This is exactly how the developers intended you to make your way through the game. Right, welcome back to Science with Spiff, as I'm about to show off a brand new exploit. Now, here's the thing about allowing you to create custom factions. They can get very overpowered very quickly, like, for example, the faction I'm playing right here today. This faction, ladies and gentlemen, are very, very broken. But they have the Silver Tongued trait, which means trade deals with free cities cost you minus 100% resources. If you couldn't tell already, ladies and gentlemen, that's a little smidge broken. You also get to start with one additional Whispering Stone, which if you didn't know is basically how you make all of these lovely free cities your vassals very, very quickly. Now, immediately, we get to start out the game already knowing exactly where the nearest free city is and already being pretty friendly with them. We can then immediately trade with them and use that to instantly Simultaneously get 10 free production per turn or 10 free mana per turn. That's right, that's an extra 50% starting mana per turn just for free. That seems fine. What about an extra 50% production? Yep, that's also good. How about a silver tongue fruit that allows your whispering stones to give you even more allegiance so you can just instantly ally with all of the free city states? Oh dear, oh god, that could probably get quite powerful indeed. So I'm just going to fast forward to the early section of the game, probably only about 20 ish turns in, where you know everyone's still starting out and nothing too crazies going on just to see what it kind of looks like. Well welcome ladies and gentlemen, it's turn 26, a little bit of time has passed and you will notice that uh, this lovely city state here is now our vassal, meaning they give me mana, they give me gold and they even give me research, wow that's wonderful. Oh and also they still give me that production, meanwhile there's another city state over here, oh they give me research, oh that's very nice, as well as all of the other stuff. Oh and then there's another city state over here, oh they're about to be a vassal of mine in three turns and they also to give me a bunch of magic crystals. Lovely. What about these guys over here? Oh, that's right. Yet another city state that is just giving me free research and in five turns will be my vassal. Oh, and over here. Oh, once again. Yep, that's a pact of loyalty. Oh, once again. Yep, that's zero money for 24 magic crystals. Hmm, yes, perfectly, perfectly, perfectly balanced. Oh, dearie me game. This seems a little bit broken. And I know it's completely broken because I'm by far the strongest faction in the game and all I've done is basically expand my capital city deliberately not settle any more cities or even build up an army and I'm still by far ranked the most powerful in the game. It does help that my research is up to 187 knowledge per turn which is absurd. Absolutely absurd. Anyway we're going to fast forward into the future a bit once I've pretty much picked up the entire world as my vassals. Now you might be thinking, well Spiff, look, having vassals is great, they give you income, they give you money, but that's useless because someone could just come along with an army and defeat them. No they can't, because with Rally the Lieges, I can just simply summon units using the endless gold I have straight to their capital city. These units, they're not bad. It's turn 26 and I can summon tier 4 units. Pretty much two of these can just wipe out an entire stack of enemy units because oh my god, I shouldn't have access to them. But I do. At the same time, I can recruit a near endless quantity of them 
just because of how many vassals I have. And if that wasn't powerful enough, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to show you something truly broken. Say hello to Blessed Reinforcements, ladies and gentlemen. It is a spell that you can cast as many times per turn as you like, and it just summons two tier 3 units to your vassal. Now, this is brilliant because you can have your vassal be at war with someone halfway across the world, and you might think that a player could defeat them. But no, a player can't if you're just continuously handing them high-powered units via magic. Oh yes, perfectly balanced. Anyway, I'm gonna fast forward a bit and uh, see where we end up without, of course, settling any more cities. Okay, right, welcome back to uh, what is meant to be the early midsection of the game. It's turn 44. Okay, we're not even anywhere near the midsection. This is like late early game and um, things have gone completely out of the bloody window, so to speak. Uh, I am up to 423 knowledge per turn, which, oh lord, is far too much. And this basically means I'm blitzing my way through the entirety of the technology tree as everything takes one to two turns to research, which as you can imagine is a little bit of an issue when for all of the other players in the game it's taking them a lot longer. At the same time I have literally endless quantities of resources and my units are nigh unstoppable. Yes, we have effectively ascended into godhood and it generally was as easy as just picking these two traits. None of the other AIs on the entire map even have a single vassal and yet I have picked up a bajillion of them. Here are all of the free cities in the world of which all of them are vassals of mine excluding one which is going to be my vassal uh, next turn. That's right, that's literally how long it takes. One turn and then these bad boys are on board. So what happens when I end my turn? Well, my research goes from 423. Uh, we pick up a brand new vassal. That's really cool. Uh, the turn moves over and well, bam, it's up to 435. I select myself a new piece of research. Oh, this tier six research here looks great. Oh yes, I'll have it in two turns time. That's fine. Oh God. Yeah, so this is a little bit of a problem because effectively at this point I could just declare war on any of the AIs and my giant vassal swarm would just systematically endlessly send units towards them raiding their entire cities into the ground, effectively softlocking them out of playing the bloody game. It's perfectly balanced, and I'm sure exactly what the developers intended. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. It turns out Age of Wonders 4 is a perfectly balanced game with no exploits whatsoever. If you enjoyed what you saw today, then guess what? You can pick up the game yourself. There's a link on down in the description. The game even has multiplayer. Why not grab a copy for your friends and invite them to a multiplayer session where you can use what you've seen in today's video to absolutely decimate that friendship and make them never want to spend time with you ever again. Ah, perfectly balanced. So thank you very much for watching. A huge thank you to all of our lovely patrons, YouTube channel members, and Paradox Interactive themselves for, for sponsoring today's video. Seriously, thank you very much. And hey, if you sat there wondering what to watch next, look no further than this video on screen now. Hand chosen by myself to be lovely for you. Anyway, goodbye. <laughs>